And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers. Uh, Mick is not here this week, but he, I promise you, he will be back next week. Uh, he is out on city business. Uh, we are pleased uh, this week to do a show that we think is very timely. Uh, we have called it uh, Conscience and the Pulpit. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the remarks of the uh, controversial Reverend Jeremiah Wright and uh, the remarks he made from the pulpit. We're going to be looking at some of those in detail with uh, a very uh, eminently qualified guest, Dr. Mike Anderson, uh, a uh, retired uh, minister but still very active in, uh, in the faith and very active uh, in uh, activities at the Presbyterian Health Foundation. Uh, but this is not a political show. We are not endorsing a candidate. We never do. We don't take positions on candidates, but we are talking about what is the response and the responsibility of the pastor and the same for the congregation. We're so glad you joined us today. Stick around. I think you'll find it interesting. We'll be right back. America had its own clean energy, abundant and available for the next century or more, and possibly indefinitely. A true 21st century energy source would cut carbon emissions in half and do every living thing a world of good. That clean American energy exists. It's natural gas, and Chesapeake is its number one explorer. For producing clean electricity, and fueling our cars without imported oil, natural gas saves money and the environment. Proving the answer to this country's energy needs is right under our feet, and we're not running out. Clean, abundant, affordable, American natural gas. Doing a world of good for our communities, our economy, and our irreplaceable planet Earth. Back to the verdict. Kent Myers, uh, Mick Cornett will be back next week. Uh, today we have with us a, a guest who's returning for his second visit on the verdict, Dr. Mike Anderson. Mike, a uh, longtime friend and uh, leading uh, citizen here in Oklahoma City, is president of the Presbyterian Health Foundation, has been for the last five years. For approximately 25 years before that, he was a senior pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church here in Oklahoma City. Uh, he uh, also, prior to that, worked with the Presbyterian Church in New York City and made the culture shock move to uh, Oklahoma from, from New York and has been here ever since. He's active in many civic and cultural and business activities here in Oklahoma City. And we're going to talk to him today about a show that actually he entitled for me, uh, Conscience and the Pulpit. Uh, Mike, welcome. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Well, we're sure <laughs> glad to have you. I, uh, I send you, uh, mixed regards to you. He's sorry he couldn't join I'm, you. I'm sure he's doing a good job for the city where he is. He, uh, I bet he is. Uh, you were in the active ministry uh, preaching every Sunday or virtually every Sunday for 25 years. And then you switched to a job like the Presbyterian Health Foundation, which is, of course, worthy in and of itself. How did you, how did you uh, take that switch from uh, those widely varying yes. responsibilities? Well, actually, I started preaching over 50 years ago. I had 50 mm -hmm. years without hardly one Sunday uh, exception that I wasn't preaching somewhere, uh, but nearly 25 at Westminster mm -hmm. itself. Uh, it was a, a significant switch, but I was 65 years of age, and I thought the church should have a young pastor and uh, it's time for me to do something else. Presbyterian Health Foundation is a great place, also has a great mission, but I find myself still speaking a lot. 
uh, but a different venue, probably five times a week. I'm involved somewhere, mm -hmm. and there isn't a day that passes. I'm not talking to somebody on sub subjects like uh, the relationship of science and God. <laughs> so the, the ministry still continues. Well, we're here today to talk a little bit about what uh, kind of restraints, if any, should there be on a, on a pastor either self-imposed or, or imposed by outside forces on what that pastor or preacher or reverend or whatever we choose to, a name we choose to call, uh, whatever restraints they may have on what they can say on a given uh, uh, day from the uh, pulpit. Um, of course, we're uh, said at the outset, we're not uh, calling this a political show because we're not intending to endorse or condemn anybody uh, that's running for public office in this show. But we do want to uh, look at some fairly controversial uh, quotes from the Reverend Jeremiah Wright made recently. And I want to call up a couple uh, right now and uh, take a look at them. After the September 11th, 2001 uh, uh, bombing, uh, Jeremiah Wright said, we bombed Hiroshima, we bombed Nagasaki, and we nuked far more than the thousands in New York and the Pentagon, and we have never batted an eye. We have supported state terrorism against Palestinians and black South Africans, and now we are indignant because the stuff we have done overseas is now brought right back to our own front yards. America's chickens are coming home to roost. Then he also said in a uh, subsequent quote um, in uh, 2003, the government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three strike law, and then wants us to sing God bless America. No, 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 and then you can read that for yourself. I just chose to abbreviate it for, uh, just because I chose to do it. Um, and it says the GD phrase uh, th three times. Uh, for as long as she acts like she is God, and she is supreme. Um, what, are your, what are your initial responses, Mike, to uh, a pastor in front of a, a church saying those types of things. Well, there's no question in my mind that uh, Reverend Wright was way over the edge and he's more than just bombastic and I would not defend anything he says at all. However, as much as I would disagree with everything he said, I would have to say that America has a long tradition of bombastic preachers and politicians both who have used both the lectern uh, of the university hall and the pulpits of churches to make outlandish statements all the way down through our history. So uh, the question really arises, should Americans continue to allow such freedom to take place in the pulpit and are we even jeopardizing the right by these outlandish uh, maneuvers to uh, support uh, a church that has tax exemption, protection from the law, without contributing to the cost of that protection and uh, uh, having that freedom jeopardized by the radical statements that are made by persons like Reverend Wright. I, I intentionally separated the third quote from the first two just so that the significance of any one would not be lost, but let's look at uh, a third uh, quote from uh, Reverend Wright. The government lied about inventing the HIV virus as a means of genocide against people of color. The government lied. Uh, it's, it sounds as if, all of, all of us can read that for what it is, but it sounds as if that's an accusation that the government uh, has invented the HIV oh. virus to wipe oh. out people of color. Ab absolutely, and it, it's a, a, not only a stupid statement, it is an absolute lie itself. And uh, so people would say, well, what's the right and the duty of a prisoner when uh, she or he hears their pastor yeah, making let's, such let's outlandish talk about statement? That. I think, uh, well, we know what happens. Uh, prisoners get up and leave. You're not uh, obligated to stay in any church. Uh, that's a free choice. And if a pastor makes those kinds of outlandish statements on a regular basis, it does say something about the prisoner. Now, I do know we have a political candidate who 
claims he does not remember any of these statements. I would have to say this on behalf of that particular candidate. Uh, I sort of agree that people don't remember what their pastor is saying. Fact is, I have evidence-based knowledge that people don't remember anything <laughs> a pastor says. I you mean, have personal I, knowledge. Personal. About that. I, I mean, I'd hear it every Sunday. I, you know, a lady comes up and says, "Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful sermon! Thank you very much. It was all superfluous." And, <laughs> and you get statements like this, and uh, you know that sometimes uh, some people, let's say, are not uh, really hearing. However, I think we have a right to uh, object uh, to our pastors and uh, within our church uh, when we disagree, and the synagogue, and the mosque. Uh, but uh, after all, we live in a world today where religious organs across the world are now becoming organizations of radical statements. Uh, the madrasas of Islam are the seedbed of teaching terrorism in some countries. Not all madrasas, I'm sure, need to be labeled that, but we know tens of thousands are in certain countries. So yeah, this me, is a huge issue for us. I'm sorry, let me interrupt and get us to a break and we'll come back and pick right up at that point. Thank you. Now, let's go to the break. Uh, you're watching The Verdict with uh, Reverend Mike Anderson. Home values are down in some states, but not in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's home values have increased 4.2% during the past 12 months. Unlike some states where home values have decreased as much as 20%. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. There may be real estate problems in some states, but there has never been a better time than now to buy or sell a home in Oklahoma. One of the most affordable states in the country, Oklahomans are buying and selling homes every day. And an Oklahoma Realtor can show you how. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. Okiwani is an Indian name for a place where children play. When we obtained the camp, we found a lot of oil debris left in the woods. We saw a commercial about how the oil and natural gas industry cleans up old oil well sites. We called the OERB and they agreed to remove tons of concrete and steel. It didn't cost us a thing. Thousands of children have left their footprints on this land. Thanks to the oil and gas industry, they will for a long time to come. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Back on the verdict, visiting with uh, Reverend Mike Anderson, and we're talking about uh, some uh, rather controversial statements that have recently been made from the pulpit in a particular church. Uh, uh, Mike, let me ask you: What guides a pastor, or you, when you were a pastor, or any pastor, in just what is appropriate to include within a sermon, and what is not? A pastor should be guided by that which is their supreme authority for. A Protestant preacher, a Presbyterian such as myself, it would be the Bible. And uh, for a Catholic, it would be the Bible and also the uh, statements of the church. For uh, a Jewish rabbi, uh, it would be Hebrew scriptures and ultimate authority. But there is such a thing also as conscience. And uh, we have a long history of the uh, uh, conscience of the church and its pulpit and its effect on politics. It was King James the first of England, who is also the same guy, who is this King, King James the sixth of Scotland, who said, uh, Presbyterians are no gentlemen. <laughs> I love that <laughs> phrase. And what he was saying is, he was having a lot of trouble with these Presbyterians who wanted to democratize the divine right of kings. And a lot of those Presbyterians, along with other Protestants, had to leave England and Scotland in those days, and uh, because of the oath Act and the Test Act, and in fact, that's part of the formation of the colonization of America. 
of people moving here for religious freedom, and that meant also the freedom of the pulpit. Well, let me ask you this. Do, do pastors ever, including yourself uh, from time to time, ever engage in what I will call shock and awe? Say something uh, just uh, outrageous uh, in order to get the, get the attention of the Outlandish uh, statements can attract Outlandish. attention. There's no question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, we plan to do that. I think it probably comes out of habit as much as anything. But uh, there are pastors who uh, are pretty good at that. Uh, and drawing a, a very vivid picture, but then taking the opposite side, which is not bad rhetoric, as you've learned in your sp speech classes in law school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, are there any topics uh, uh, that you can think of, either in these quotes or otherwise, that are simply off limits? Well, I, I would myself think it's off limits to give sermons advocating for one candidate or one political party. Mm -hmm. I think the church serves the whole society. Also, the church in America, while it's not established by law, its right of existence is protected by law, and the church does have the advantage of being excluded from any kind of property tax. And pastor salaries, uh, while the pastor is taxed for salary, the manse allowance is given and uh, it's not taxed and the pastor can use it as a deduction. So I think uh, religion in America in a sense is being supported by uh, Americans through this indirect tax exemption that affects uh, individual pastors as well as the properties of the church and we therefore ought to be very careful not to use that for the political advantage of one person or one political party. Let me ask you, uh, situations change over the years and you were in the pulpit uh, plenty long to see uh, evolution of certain things in, in this country. Does the conscience of the church change over time? It uh, probably does change uh, somewhat. However, the larger parameters uh, would be based on that biblical ethic of doing justice, uh, loving kindness, and walking humbly with your God, as Micah said. Um, however, these great prophets of the Old Testament, the teaching of Christ in the Gospels, the teaching of Paul in his writings to the church in the epistles, have always outlined that the ultimate goal and ethic is the love of others as oneself and the love of God with your heart, soul, and mind. Given those parameters, I think we might have to be very careful how we line up with certain political ideologies. I think that would be uh, not correct for most pastors' interpretation of their mission. Do you have any, did you or do pastors generally have any outside source you could go to for guidance if you had a question about whether I ought to include this or not? For instance, the church board, spouse perhaps, uh, uh, other pastors? Sure, uh, that's definitely. That happens all the time from seminary training on down through pastoral conferences. I would say one of the biggest guides of the church happens to be the dialogue you have with your church officers. So the men and women who are elected officers of the church uh, give pastors all kinds of information directly and indirectly. And uh, they, most people feel very free to talk to their pastor about political positions the pastor may take or not take and uh, advocate for certain positions. And they do this uh, openly because this is a very open society in America in which we live. The, uh, you've referred a couple of times to the uh, uh, tax breaks that are given to religious organizations. And as we know, the Internal Revenue Code uh, does give tax tax exempt status to organizations as long as they uh, uh, are not uh, advocating a particular political position. Uh, how does a pastor balance that uh, tax break uh, when it comes in uh, potential conflict with what the pastor thinks ought to be said? Well, I think the pastor has a right for her or himself to say in conscience what they think is a correct position yeah. regarding their faith. But when it comes to supporting particular political initiatives, I think the pastor needs to be back off and let the people of the church decide that at the voting booth and uh, give them the larger framework in which to deal with this. 
What's your general view, uh, in stepping back in a little broader expanse here, about the uh, establishment clause of the Constitution and separation of church and state? I, I, I think it's wonderful that we live in a country that does allow faith to operate freely, but it does separate the organization of the church from the organization of politics. It doesn't separate religion as a belief or certainly religion as a value from the, the state. And so separation of church and state really is separation of the organization of the church so that we do not have organized popes, archbishops, bishops who are also confirmed by political appointment, which was the past history of the church. What, uh, just in about a minute left, uh, <clears throat> what's your view about the church that invites a particular candidate to speak from the pulpit on a Sunday morning? If that candidate is running for office, That's what I, I mean. think you need to have both on all candidates speak from the pulpit. Uh, at Westminster Church. Equal time. Equal time. At Westminster Church, we had George Nye, governor of the state, and Henry Bellman, governor of the state. They sat very close to each other, one pew away, <laughs> Sunday after Sunday. But uh, we never had either George or Henry actually take on the pulpit. They wouldn't do it anyhow in order to give a political speech as they're running for office. This is not the way the church ought to operate. <laughs> Mike, we're out of time. Thank you so much Thank for these you. wonderful comments. We've been visiting with Mike Anderson. Uh, thanks for joining us, but don't leave. We'll be right back. comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back to The Verdict. Kent Myers uh, closing up this show. Thanks to Dr. Anderson for joining us and talking about a controversial subject and putting it in terms that I thought was uh, quite understandable and, and helpful. And I hope you found it interesting as well. If you want to uh, contact Dr. Anderson, uh, take a look at his website, which we have pulled up now, www.phfokc.com. And also, uh, we'd love to hear from you at our website, theverdict.tv. Let us know what you think about this show or any others and any show you'd like to see us do. We do pay attention to what you tell us. On behalf of Mick Cornett, we thank you so much for watching uh, this Sunday and look forward to seeing you next Sunday when Mick will return. So we'll see you again on The Verdict.
The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.